Tonight, I am happy to welcome Jonathan Marshall here from Austin. Um, I came to know Jonathan's work from uh, Grimm Gallery um, in New York, only to find out that we have a mutual friend in Nathan Green. Some of you know Nathan Green, and that Jonathan is based in Austin. Um, valuable and meaningful connections, I think. But upon um, seeing the work cold before knowing Jonathan was one of us, um, I was immediately intrigued by the, beauty, the beautiful notations of mapping, plotting, and searching. There is evidence of research in his work, and with that, investigation, exploration, and findings, all of which denotes humanness, existence, marking, and making. Um, another connection, if you would. Jonathan was born in West Virginia, eventually came to Texas, where he received a BFA um, from UT uh, in Austin in 2003. And then he went on to um, Virginia Commonwealth University in Richmond for his MFA, which he received in 2010. In 2010, his solo exhibition, Doubled Vision, was at Art Palace in Houston, another connection some of you may be aware of, as well as his work being included in the Blanton's new works for the collection that same year, which I find impressive to have just received his MFA and be in the new works from the collection at the Blanton. Um, he has shown consistently nationally and internationally since um, at least 2005, including in Amsterdam, Berlin, Istanbul, New York, and significantly in Austin, Texas, including hybrid forms in 2012 at Austin Museum of Art slash Art House and um, OK Mountain, so there's where the connections begin, um, as well as the 2005 New American Talent at Art House in Austin um, that um, is, an, is a prestigious exhibition. I was excited to see that he had actually, his work had actually been in that show. Plus, um, I need to note that he also showed at Mulcahy Modern, I found out in looking at his um, bio, which I found really interesting. It was a wonderful past gallery um, in Oak Lawn um, uh, that some of you may remember. It was before Oak Lawn is what it is. It's when Oak Lawn was beginning to be what it is. Um, tonight, Jonathan is here to share his work and ideas in the um, presentation titled, Was Here? Also the title of his recent solo exhibition at Grimm in uh, New York, probing formidable questions concerning the relationship of the individual to the larger whole, resilience and limitations, and the necessity of systems within the larger scheme of things. If you would, please join me in welcoming Jonathan Marshall. Thank you, Terry, uh, for the beautiful introduction. And thank you to you all for coming and being here with me today as I talk to you about my work. Um, I don't get out very often uh, between kids and a significant house construction going on and my work. Um, so it's really nice to be here in a room of like-minded individuals in this beautiful museum. Um, as I was getting ready, I was thinking about like this lectern here, um, which is something I don't find myself behind very often, and this beautiful room, uh, which kind of seems like I'm at the helm of like a great spaceship, <laughs> and like this is our craft. And so, if you would permit me to uh, take you on a journey for the next hour or so, I'd really appreciate that. Um, and they tell me I can drink whiskey while I'm doing this, so I'm going to <laughs> indulge in that treat as well. So your captain is drinking, but I don't know. Maybe it'll help. Um, as I was uh, going through preparing for this talk, I was thinking about some questions that had been at the heart of my practice uh, for about 10 years. Um, which, although I did do a great deal here in Texas um, in the early 2000s, I really consider like hitting my stride around 2010 when I did finish grad school and moved to New York um, and had had that time to reflect and mature. Um, so the three questions themselves are, 
What are the limits of human resilience in the face of seemingly insurmountable odds? The second question, which is kind of tied into that first question, is what is the nature of the relationship between the individual and the limitations of the body in an environment? And then the third question is uh, what, what methods do we possess to understand massive objects beyond the scale of our finite form in time and space? Um, and I'm gonna try to use if just a few works to address each of those questions um, and then also take you through some source material that I've used or like extracurricular stuff that I just find super interesting. Um, so to start with that first one, two part question, this is a painting I made in 2013 um, called The Mostly False History of the Amazon. Uh, it's about 13, I think, by eight feet wide in two panels. And all of the black stuff is like paper that has been collaged on there to make this image of the Amazon. And all of the text comes from um, Percy Fawcett's uh, writings about uh, traveling through the Amazon, like a first-hand survival account, basically, of traveling through the Amazon. Now, Fawcett was a British explorer. He uh, was searching for a lost city called Z. Um, that he had based a lot of his reasoning for thinking there was this city in the Amazon on um, theosophy and believing that there was a lost tribe of Jews that had 2,000 years ago miraculously sailed to the Amazon and created like a race of uh, white uh, Native Americans. Um, so it's kind of like, or it's completely bunk history. And he thought that he and his son, Raleigh, not Raleigh, sorry, Jack, uh, Raleigh was their friend. <clears throat> he thought that he and his son Jack were going to be like the messiahs for this uh, race of people who had created this great lost stone city in the Amazon. Um, only to go there on multiple excursions, never find anything, and then uh, ultimately it's likely that he was murdered in 1926 on an expedition there, um, pretty close to where he would have thought the lost city of Z was. Um, so that on the left is Exploration Fawcett, which are the journals that I used to write this mostly false history of the Amazon. Um, and then on the right, the story was originally introduced to me by this book by David Grann, which was a real bestseller like about a dozen years ago. <clears throat> so I'm sure some of you probably read it. Um, the ironic thing about his whole journey was that there are lost cities in the Amazon. They're just not what he was looking for. They were made out of wood so the jungle has like decomposed them over hundreds of years. Um, and obviously they weren't white people of Jewish descent. Uh, there's Percy Fawcett in the middle with his nice like uh, safari hat on there. Um, and then they made a bad movie about it that also some of you might have seen. It so often happens with these like amazing stories that some Hollywood finds a way to really screw it up. Um, so I don't know, I, I guess it's okay if you wanna, it's cool like Amazon footage, you know, people in nice hats looking sweaty. <laughs> Otherwise, not very good. Um, <clears throat> another painting I made in that matter, manner um, is called The Wreck of Hope and, and in, uh, excuse me, The Wreck of Hope and Endurance. Um, I made this painting in, a, in also about 2012, 13-ish. Um, and it's based on a painting you probably recognize by Caspar David Friedrich called The Sea of Ice, which was done in 1824. And it was from a scene in uh, the, like the North Pole, North Passage. Um, however, the narrative that I've laid out here is by F.A. Worsley. It's his firsthand account of his journey um, with Ernest Shackleton to find the South Pole, uh, also British early, uh, 20th century guys out there doing that kind of stuff. Sip of whiskey for them. <laughs> um, <clears throat> that would be F.A. Worsley in the center. Um, that book over there, Endurance, is where I took a lot of the uh, text for that piece. And then this is just a really great book cover that I found while looking at images the other day that I couldn't pass up. Sometimes they're just images that are like so beautiful you can't let them go. Um, <clears throat> moving on from there, 
I uh, made this piece, started making this piece in 2014 and showed it in Amsterdam um, and then in a group show that was like at a weird time of year, so it just like goes into their storage unit. Um, I was never super happy with how the painting turned out, so what you're seeing right here is actually the 2018 update of the painting, which I recently showed in New York. Um, and it is, as it says, the incomplete history of walking. So as I'm looking at all these different narratives of survival, the most like rudimentary way for us to get around is obviously on foot. And so if you uh, notice, most of you probably notice that this is a map of the world in uh, what is the Dymaxion faction by Buckminster Fuller, whereby you, know, you can take the sphere of the world, flatten it out into two dimensions, and all of the land masses remain in their proper proportion to one another, which is a really nice kind of depoliticizing way of looking at the world. Um, in this piece, it also has the advantage that humans walked out of Africa on like the upper left of the uh, <clears throat> painting, and you know, 75,000 years ago, and then make their way to Antarctica in that Shackleton journey, early 1900s. So it also, left to right, tells the story of us filling up those blank spots on the map to the point that we are now. Um, other things in there, like if you look on the red, kind of where India is, that would be uh, like Buddhist religious pilgrimages. So they were categorized with red markings. Um, up on the right where the big gray uh, long vertical band is, those are all political marches on Washington, D.C. There are a lot of like individual marches, the Bataan Death Marches in there. And like I said, the first people, uh, something like 1954, Mary Leakey found uh, footprints, fossilized footprints from people who had walked in that part of Africa uh, like something like 2.5 million years ago, so that's marked on there. <coughs> um, around the same time that I was making that piece, my first child, my son Jack, was born. Um, and I actually dedicated that piece to him, uh, sort of as a way of, I mean, not only do I hope or humbly believe to be like communicating in this ancient language of art, but I also hope that if I were not around to speak to him, I would be able to you know, kick him in the butt a little bit to um, be motivated to treat the world as a place of wonder. Um, so that's why I dedicated that, that piece to him. Not to mention that walking is really that first step towards freedom and adventure and understanding the world. Um, so as I've been doing all this stuff for like 20 years, I've also been, uh, a carpenter and have designed and built a lot of furniture. This is like the first good piece of furniture I think I've made. And it was a rocking chair that I made for um, my wife Haley and my son Jack uh, right after Jack was born. Um, it's based in its form on uh, actually an Eames LCL LCW lounge chair, which is like a super iconic piece of furniture. Um, not the big psychologist chair that everybody sees that the Eames have, but the uh, like molded plywood lower one that has the molded plywood legs. It's very low to the ground. My wife's a short lady. I wanted to make her a chair that was comfortable enough to um, carry a baby in, rock a baby in, but also short enough that her short legs could rock the chair. <laughs> she would be mad at me if she knew I said that. She's beautiful. I know, yes, no, she's beautiful. <laughs> it's just, she's, yeah. Um, around that same time, I made this writing desk. So again, thinking about furniture and useful objects as being these ways to uh, uh, augment or improve your uh, like reading, thinking, writing, drawing, etc. Um, and it has a painted front, so that drawer right there is actually painted. Um, and I was just playing around with like different surface colors, atypical to furniture, um, and then you know incorporating a lot of mahogany and brass. Which, if we're on this topic of like exploration and all this, you know, great ships and whatnot, those are like 
materials that kind of tie into that. Um, and the top is rubbed with graphite powder and then sealed in really well. So it's like it's been drawn on forever. <clears throat> this man is named Salvador Alvarenga. And uh, in January of 2014, he washed up on shore in uh, the Marshall Islands on a small atoll called uh, Eben um, after having been at sea on an open boat for 438 days as a castaway. Um, Alvarenga was a commercial fisherman, albeit on like a very small scale. So he and another companion named Ezekiel Cordoba got out on a little boat that's about two pickup trucks long and about as wide um, with a plastic tub that they would fill with ice, you know, about this tall, five feet wide by five feet long. Um, they would fill that with ice to bring in the haul in. And uh, Ezekiel and Alvarenga get uh, caught in a storm off the coast of Costa Azul, Mexico, pushed out to sea um, with a broken motor uh, and a waterlogged radio after this storm. So they basically have nothing. Um, and Alvarenga, having been a subsistence hunter in his native El Salvador, uh, when he wasn't fishing, he was going on these like camping trips to augment his like grocery runs with meat. Um, so he was already a really comfortable seaman and a comfortable hunter. So he decides that he's going to start. They like had fashioned a hook out of some part of the motor that they drop in the ocean. Um, <clears throat> so he decides I'm just going to hang my hands over the edge and like grab something when it swims by. Which, like in all the books that I've read about survival at sea and all this kind of stuff, no one can ever make that work, but this guy could do it apparently. He also got really good at like any time a little duck, he would call them sea ducks, would land on the edge of the boat, he would grab it and break one of its wings, which sounds horribly brutal obviously, and put it in the bow of the boat and have like this coop of these seabirds that any time he got hungry he would crack its neck and eat it. Um, which is totally gruesome, but it kept him alive for 15 months at sea in an open boat. So that's pretty amazing. Um, his buddy Cordoba, about four months in, gets sick from an uh, eating sea turtle and kind of loses his will then to keep going with this crazy thing and stops eating, dies. Alvarenga leaves him on the boat for six days talking to him uh, and eventually buries him at sea. Um, here, I have a picture of his boat, actually. Yeah, there's the boat. Oh, and it's based, I, I read this book that this story comes from, 438 Days, it's really fantastic. Um, and then this past year, I made this piece uh, about him and several other individuals that of the past few years have, uh, I think it says something like, a group of normal people who acted admirably when the situation called for it kind of thing, 2014 to the present. And so you have Alvarenga on the left. Um, you have uh, Diamond Reynolds in the center, who was the partner of Philando Castile when he was shot by police outside of Minneapolis. And you know, I'm not on Facebook, but I know that video made the rounds of her like keeping her cool as this guy is being murdered at the hands of police while her daughter is in the back of the car. Um, and then I have the Students of the Never Again moment on the far movement on the far right. Um, and this is just like normal people who did the right thing when it was necessary. And so I felt like I should give them like a little tip of the hat um, in my modest way. <clears throat> a few years ago, well, more than a few years ago now, a really good friend mate gave me this book called Crossing the Continent, um, which is the story of the first Spanish explorers of uh, Texas and North Mexico um, told from the story of one of the survivors who happened to, or the story is told in the book from one of the survivors of the expedition who uh, happened to be an African slave brought along with one of the noblemen. Um, um, the expedition ended up leaving Spain in 1527, 
with uh, 600 people, military men. They wouldn't let couples go back then, so there were women, but they weren't married to any of the men. Um, and the idea was to colonize New Spain, Florida, and look for gold, like always. So they get there to uh, Tampa Bay in the spring of 1528. Um, there's about 450 of them then. They start looking for gold. They meet some Native Americans. They, give, they see a little bit of gold. They say, yes, there's a ton of gold up in Appalachia, uh, which is like the armpit of Florida. I'm going to skip ahead to this right now. It's a map. It'll help me describe. So they walk from Tampa Bay uh, up to the armpit of Florida, number five. Um, and at number four, the captain of the expedition, they've got three boats. He takes 300 men inland, 150 stay on the boats. They send uh, those boats looking around for Tampa Bay because they had crappy maps of the Gulf of Mexico at that time, so they didn't know where it was. They're actually on St. Pete, which is like just the other side of Tampa Bay. Like you could, you know, run to Tampa Bay in about 10 minutes. Um, so they were horribly lost and just looking for gold and acting like complete assholes the whole time. Um, as is usually the case. Uh, <clears throat> they team up with this Native American chief uh, named Dolchinchelin, and he's like, I'll take you guys through here, but I want a share of the booty when we get up to Appalachia, which I've been calling the armpit of Florida. They called it Appalachia. Um, so by the time they make it to Appalachia, they're like, there's no gold, they get some corn, they're starving to death, essentially, at this point. Um, they weren't prepared for an overland expedition. Um, they're kind of getting their asses kicked by uh, Native Americans at this point, who are just way better with 10,000 years of like bow and arrow technology than their sort of new technology muskets in a humid environment are. Um, so they decide, OK, we got to get off the land. We know there's this settlement called Panu Panuco, excuse me. Uh, uh, on the sort of northeastern coast of Mexico. Let's go there. Like I said, they had crappy maps of the Gulf of Mexico. They thought Panuco was going to be like a thousand miles away. It's actually more like 3,000 miles away. So, with that sort of harebrained scheme in their heads, they decide to melt down all of their uh, crossbows, stirrups, uh, spears and whatnot, slaughtering the horses that they had with them and using the skins as bellows. And with that, they melt down their armor and uh, forge their, that iron into like axes, nails, hammers, uh, saws, with which they proceed to make five kind of lousy rafts um, using uh, the, ho the horse hair as rigging. Um, and caulking, and uh, their clothing as sails. So they're basically like naked at this point. They set into the Gulf of Mexico. They <clears throat> had made water bags out of, uh, out of uh, some of the horse hides, like these big wineskins that begin to putrefy uh, part of the way into the journey. So they're getting some kind of sickness from that. People are dying of dehydration. They go into inland every once in a while, and they're just getting their butts kicked every time. So it's looking really bad. And then they get to uh, the mouth of the Mississippi there, and the currents push the commander's raft out away from everyone else, out of sight. But they hear him say, every man for himself, like right before. So nice guy. <laughs> um, Around November of 1528, they get T-boned by a hurricane uh, near Galveston. And uh, there's about 50 of them left at that point. They spend the winter of 1528 in this uh, area of the south end of Galveston Island, which I've spent some time like trudging around looking at some of the things that they might have seen there, because it's like the same kind of landscape, even though the region has completely changed. Um, during that winter, 
the Native Americans, they were an outer band of the Karankawa, and they were uh, experiencing like a really hard time of their own. That was the end of the Little Ice Age, so it was unseasonably cold. They were in the midst of this famine, and then they start trading these Spaniards around between the different bands. <clears throat> um, and eventually, every fall, this, the remaining Spaniards would come to the area south of San Antonio, which is called, in what I've read, uh, the Monte, where uh, the prickly pear, a large area of prickly pear, uh, lived at that point. And that fall time, which you can look around now <clears throat> and see that the prickly pear is turning red from its like green. Um, so every year, for thousands of years, before this was settled by Europeans, Native Americans would come to that area and form alliances and gorge on this ripe prickly pear fruit. It was like a time of plenty. Um, and side note, when I picture these things, I like to think of it like, who would be in this movie or like what would this movie be like? And I can't help but think about Dune and the Mentat, like sucking on, what was it? Like they drank something that um, turned their lips red. So here you have all these like Span Catholic Spaniards naked running around with all these hunter-gatherer Native Americans and everyone's got like red everywhere and it's just partying their faces off probably. So I don't know, it seems like a really interesting scene if you could put yourself in that. Um, in that zone. Um, I made another piece uh, that focuses on the four final, the final four survivors. Um, after 1534, they, they meet up and they find Cabeza de Vaca, who many of you probably know from like Texas State uh, School um, history classes. Um, so you have Esteban, who was the uh, slave of Andres Dorantes on the bottom left here. I've decided he should be played by Benicio del Toro, and that Esteban should be Michael K. Williams, and that um, their other friend, uh, Alonso del Castillo, should be played by Domnal Gleeson, and that Cabeza de Vaca would be a really good, uh, or rather, Willem Dafoe, would be a really good Cabeza de Vaca. Because he was kind of a bastard, you can tell from the writing and just the way that uh, the, most of the accounts of the story come from a report that he published in 1542 when he came back from the uh, ordeal, um, as it were. And uh, he's, he's kind of like the showman, like the BSer of the group. So I also thought of them as Beatles. So he would be the John Lennon Alonso del Castillo would be, uh, wait, no, it's in there. I can't remember now. John Lennon. Alonso del Castillo. Okay, yeah, sorry. Yeah, Esteban is George Harrison. And uh, John Lennon is uh, Cabeza de Vaca. Uh, Domhnall Gleeson, Paul McCartney, because he kind of was like the young pretty boy. And then Benicio del Toro would be uh, Ringo Starr, because in this narrative, I can't figure out why he has any business being there and why he survived throughout the whole thing. So <laughs> he was just like tough, indestructible, etc. cetera. Um, along the way, go back to our map here, um, they break out from their sort of indentured servitude with the Native Americans of the Texas coast, and they start to work their way into um, like more mystical uh, tribes of northern Mexico, which, uh, and they start to like realize that people want them because they look so crazy, like it's three Catholic Spaniards and one African, um, and none of these people had ever seen anyone that looks like any of these people. Um, so, they start to be, it starts to be requested that they heal people. Uh, and they manage to do that largely because uh, Alonso del Castillo, Paul McCartney, Domhnall Gleeson, just so we know who, you're, we know who we're talking about here. Uh, he <clears throat> was the son of a Spanish doctor. So 
16th century European medical knowledge, maybe not that great, but probably better than nothing under this uh, scenario. Uh, they kind of blend that knowledge with like some Catholic flourishes, signs of the cross, splashing of blessed water, et cetera, et cetera. And it works like gangbusters and everybody loves them and they're getting, being given gifts everywhere they go. Um, they work their way to the top of the spiritual hierarchy in a sense. Um, by chance, that is like the dotted green line area is the natural uh, growing habitat of peyote. Uh, they don't mention that in the book at all, but somehow they become like these demigods without doing peyote. I don't know, it seems like fishy to me that it would get super mystical just by chance when you're around like psychedelic drugs growing out of the ground. That's what happened at any rate. <laughs> By um, like the end of 1535, 1536, they're making their way through uh, the Big Bend region where they see the first um, uh, permanent stone settlements uh, and signs of like permanent ag agriculture. Uh, and those happen to be the outskirts of the Pueblo culture um, of Colorado and Arizona and New Mexico. Um, I also made this piece called La, La, I always get tongue, uh, La Relacion, uh, which is uh, the book that, uh, the skeleton image there is made up of all the text of Cabeza de Vaca's book that I mentioned earlier that he wrote when he came back uh, to Spain in the end of the 1530s. Also, by chance, first book published about America. Um, I made this piece this year also. It's about 12 feet wide and four feet tall. And basically, it's the story that I laid out uh, to you just now of the four survivors of the Narvaez expedition. Um, and they occupy that, their narrative occupies sort of the purple squiggly line that comes from the left and goes to the right. Um, and then, my experiences in this area, which I feel uh, justified in talking about and having things to say about because I've spent most of my life along the Gulf Coast in one manner or another, or traveling there, it's like my backyard, as is West Texas. Um, our backyards, right? Um, my experiences in that place, including going to like the sad Bloody Mary bar where uh, you, which that would be, well, you can't really see it in that image. Don't worry about it. I'll just tell you the story. The place that the first Europeans landed in the Americas is like almost unmarked, except for sort of a bad uh, decaying cement marker, and then like a sad uh, sports bar. And so I had a turkey sandwich and a Bloody Mary with my dad, and you know we thought about the course of America over the past 480 years. <laughs> also, another thing I could say about that, La Relacion being the first book about America, I sort of feel like with what we know now about how the polar ice or the sea ice is going to melt, and a lot of these areas are gonna be um, covered, submerged under sea uh, at some point in the probably distant future, uh, we're sort of coming over the hill, like we're coming to the end again of the habitability of a lot of that part of the country, part of the world. Um, as I was being obsessed about that story and just thinking about it all the time, I also, it was around the time I moved back to Austin in 2015, and um, I was continuing to make and design furniture. As you can see, you remember the desk from not too long ago. Uh, that's also, side note, beautiful painting by my dear friend uh, and diamond in the rough, Michael Kennedy Costa, um, who I went to grad school with. And that lamp is a lamp that I uh, made and designed with uh, my partners in a democratic cooperative design business that I started uh, when I moved back to Austin. Um, most of what we do is like commission for architects and uh, businesses, et cetera. Um, but the name that we go by, Build House, 
comes from, uh, is a direct nod to Bauhaus, obviously. And I've always really admired that focus that they had on synthesizing craft and uh, art into usable functional objects. Um, so I guess in a way I'm trying to provide something like that uh, for my community and then also make something like that with my community. There's the floor lamp. And those, they're kind of cool because it's like this, uh, do you guys remember touch lamps? It was an old timey thing like where you would have these tacky lamps with like glass shades and you could touch them and they would turn on and off. We thought that was super cool so we got some and rigged them up to this so there's not a switch you just touch uh, with like your big toe, either the steel plate on the bottom or the exposed rods on the, uh, on the shade. And then the shade is like hand woven by a lady that I work with who does beautiful textile work. So that's what, we, that's what I make with my friends. And these nice little sandwichy uh, uh, um, cabinet poles, drawer poles, which like I make, I've designed furniture for people and you always get to like this point where it needs a handle. And you go look and it's like, well, that one's $5, but it sucks. And that one's $45 and it's just like kind of not tacky. So I was like, I'm pretty sure for that I can do better. So we made these little, uh, you know, Neapolitan sandwich uh, handles out of like exotic wood and brass. Um, and they're super fun. Um, okay, so in the stories I've shared with you thus far, um, it's really important to keep in mind that there's this relationship between the limitations of the body and the environment, which kind of goes back to those initial questions that I had. Um, not only is there that like relationship with the individual and the environment, but there's also an in, a relationship with the tools that they have at hand. And then in the case of like furniture that I've made, the furniture is kind of becoming like a tool in a way to do the exploration within the studio that I want to do. Um, just like Alvaranga found his metal hook, which he soon lost. But um, the same goes for these films, which not only do that, but they also uh, do have this thing where the environment almost becomes like another character. Um, which I think is a really interesting idea and one that I've been playing with for a long time. Oh, and also Sunshine, if you guys have seen that movie, they have, that's the best spacesuits in any uh, science fiction film ever, in case you were wondering. Uh, my like, best friend is a physicist, and he just gets so mad about that movie, because not only is like, the environment another character, but the sun is another character, which is a super cool like, conceptual thing. If you haven't seen this movie, spoiler alert. Uh, the sun like doesn't, the sun is trying to go out. So what they decide to do is get a bunch of nuclear bombs and fly them into the sun. Great idea. Uh, to start it up again, right, being the, the idea. Uh, and my science buddy is just like, that's so dumb, that would never happen. It's like so bad, I can't believe you like that stupid movie. And I was like, the spacesuits, man, look at those spacesuits. They're amazing. Um, at any rate, um, the sun becoming this other character in that movie, and like the sun does everything in its power as they get closer and closer to drop their payload to like not want to die. Really interesting idea. Um, so this is a sculpture I made, by the way, but I'm going to tell you another story first. Um, a year in grad, I spent a year of grad school in like horrible chronic back pain, which is, sounds so lame, but um, it was like the kind of chronic back pain where like you lose weight and uh, it sort of takes over everything in your life. Um, the positive things I can say about it are that I did start to think about this relationship between the limitations of the body and what we're able to make as artists or craftspeople. Um, Around that time, I started to get, as I was thinking about pain and art, I thought, well, tattooing is a very, uh, like, one-to-one, -one, one step of separation analogy there that you can make. Um, and not only is it a proxy for, like, the beauty and pain of life and a cheating of death, 
when you leave these indelible marks on your body, um, you're also like really rooted in your body as you're getting the tattoo. Um, I gave myself a couple of stick and pokes that, uh, for a video project that I made in 2009 that I'm not uh, super proud of, but I am proud of the tattoos that I gave myself, which still look really good. Uh, there's one on my, uh, above my right knee that's the Voyager 1 spacecraft, and then one above my left knee that is the uh, bone as the first tool in 2001. Um, the Voyager 1 spacecraft being like the most distant thing made by humans, the most distant man-made object, obviously. Um, getting back to this piece, uh, called Narthesia Man, made around 2012 of uh, ink and paper mache primarily uh, in a mahogany box with a linen backing and some little steel supports to hold him up in his position. Uh, some of you might recognize the form uh, from Utzi, the man found in the glacier in 1993, who happened to have uh, tattoos on his body, I discovered, which was why I wanted to go ahead and make this piece out of him. Excuse me. <clears throat> so, um, Utzi's tattoos. Utzi had like some bracelets on his wrists and some bands on his ankles, and he uh, had some like points, like acupuncture points on his spine. And by doing MRIs of his body after they had found him, they were able to deduce that he actually did suffer from like chronic lower back pain. So I felt this kind of kinship with this like 5,000 year old glacier mummy. And so I was able to go visit him in, uh, in 2012 uh, by coincidence. And uh, at this place called the South Tyrol Museum of Archaeology, which is not far from where he was discovered by a couple of hikers in 1993. Um, and it's kind of a dopey little museum, but they did not blow the opportunity to make displaying him completely amazing. Um, you take this little like electric press lift up, I guess so like kids can't see him or something, but I'm not really sure. Um, and you get lifted up, the wall is all like stainless steel slats, and you look through this tiny little window into this kind of igloo box where the walls and the floor are all made of blocks of ice, and he's on this, sorry, he's on this, uh, plas uh, sorry, tempered glass curved gurney. It's like just what you would want to see in that scenario. So I always like to give them a, a hats off for, you know, doing a good job and not missing a good opportunity. Um, the tattoo, so I took his body as the form and then I started making tattoos of, tattoos that I have, tattoos that other friends have, um, tattoos of famous historical figures, a few celebrities, um, Thomas Edison's tattoo, which he gave himself right after he invented the first electric tattoo needle, which is a little five on a die, like right between, right on the webbing of his hand. Um, so there's a bunch of interesting things on there and he's sort of supposed to be like this amalgamation of all these different people into one object. I also made, um, there's a little close up of him. He has some like traditional sailor type things. Um, this is another mummy. Uh, called Paziric Maiden, and that name actually corresponds to another actual mummy who was found in Siberia. And uh, she was part of a, I, I wanted to do like male, female, and she was part of uh, a tribe and was likely um, a chief or shaman or like a very important sort of spiritual uh, leader in the, in the group. Um, and some of the tattoos on this body are ones that she actually had, but I kind of wanted her to be like this uh, goddess of animals and cre other creatures, um, protector in a way. Um, so all those tattoos on her kind of become like these amulets of that. And there's a close up with a nice armadillo. Since I am from Texas, I had to slip an armadillo. And that, that sort of caribou looking thing, that's one that she, the, the actual body 
uh, the Paziric Maiden actually has. Oh, and so here I am, after all that, I was like, well, I gotta get a real tattoo now since I only have these silly ones that I gave myself. Um, and so I, through my gallery in Amsterdam, I had a connection to Hank Schiffmacher, who is not only a uh, fantastic craftsman uh, and has been tattooing for, um, you know, 50 years. He's sort of like an anthropologist and a historian of all things tattoo and tattoo ephemera. Um, and more than a lot of American tattoo artists that I've come to understand, he really f has focused on this like Polynesian thing that's full of a lot of symbology. So I asked Hank to give me this tattoo of a spiral, which you'll see later. Um, below there is So It Goes, which is the big Kurt Vonnegut saying. And then um, the Muleers Peaks from Big Bend, which is a place close to my heart. Um, and below that, I was like, well, you can fill in what you want below there, Hank. And he said, uh, Mexico, Big Bend. And I said, yes, please, that would be very nice. And then along the top, I said, you know, that's your, your spot too, please. Figure out something nice there. Um, and so those little uh, triangles with the T's on top is a traditional Polynesian design, which um, denotes a village and everyone has a chicken in the village. I thought it was really beautiful, and I didn't know that's what it was until after he gave it to me. Oh, the crazy thing was, uh, I was asking him about Utsi as he's giving me this tattoo. And I was like, do you think those things on his back, like the little dots, were those like medical record kind of deal, like acupuncture? Uh, and he, <laughs> he like, he's and he stops and goes, when they pulled him out of the ice, they called me to come and analyze his tattoos. And I was like, ah. <laughs> <laughs> Almost passed out. Uh, not because of being tattooed, that wasn't nearly as bad as I thought. <laughs> but um, just to really, like, I felt honored to be in his presence and be, like, uh, having something pass through this, like, conduit of so much knowledge about what we often talk about as the ancient language of art. And a folk art at that. I mean, tattoo is really one of the most ancient folk arts. Okay, getting back in, I'm gonna check on our questions momentarily um, and move on to the last, uh, which is what tools do we possess to understand massive things beyond the scale of our human form in both time and space? Um, jumping to Richard Serra. Uh, I feel like if I'm an example of an artist highlighting the relationships between like scale and location and the individual, um, Richard Serra has been doing a really good job for decades of completely screwing with those relationships in a really intelligent and amazing way, obviously. Um, most art, like I said, is the viewer, the architectural space you're in, and the object. And um, with Richard Serra, you're not really, it's not architecture, it's sort of beyond sculpture. And even when it's big, like this beautiful one you have out here, it's not really monumental. It's more like ontological. Um, just like that one is the perfect example of that. Like you cannot come to know that object as a single object. You can only understand moving past it uh, and having moments with it. Um, a great example where like form negates Physical attributes is Delineator, which totally blew my mind when they installed it while I was living in New York and I got to see it. Um, I did a little like go online, do the steel calculate, figure out how big each slab is by looking on MoMA's website and then did a steel calculation of 10 by 26 feet by one inch thick and it's 10,618 pounds. And I mean, that, it just looks like a yoga mat <laughs> when you're there. And here they are, I was like, oh, there's gotta be cool pictures of them installing that. And there were. Um, Cause I was looking at that thing thinking like, what, they had to like re-engineer the ceiling or something. At any rate, um, 
Moving on to the Fra Mauro map, which getting off of Richard Serra, the opposite, we're gonna get back into understanding the individual within the broader whole. Um, this is a map made in 1450 by an Italian monk named Fra Mauro. Um, and it's probably, if not the earliest, in my opinion, the most beautiful depiction of the old world. Um, and a great example of art bringing uh, the beyond down into the human scale and like a, a abstraction. From there we go to the first whole image of the earth, which is called the blue marble. And it was taken in 1972 by the crew of Apollo 17. Um, I later found out that actually this is the first whole image of the earth which was taken in 1967 by the ATS-3 uh, satellite. And uh, it was made up of a composite of images of the Earth. So, and then it was used by Stuart Brand as the cover image for the whole Earth catalog. Uh, Stuart Brand, I have to find the quote I found of his about making the whole Earth catalog. Okay, so Stuart Brand said, I wanna make this thing called a whole earth catalog so that anyone on earth can pick up a telephone and find out the complete information on anything. That's my goal. So like that is 1968 internet, right? And the cover image is based on a simulacrum of the whole earth, which just seemed weird to me because um, I thought that that was the cover image for the whole earth catalog. And then I'm looking through this for this talk, and it's actually the phony image of the whole Earth that's the image for the whole Earth catalog, which kind of is like the proto-internet. Um, so in that scenario, that the internet has already become an abstraction yet again for that term world. Going back to like the probably earliest and most beautiful uh, figuring of the concept of world was uh, by Eratosthenes in 240 BC. And he was able to uh, find the circumference of the earth within like 10% accuracy uh, by taking a rod, which he knew the length of, and uh, measuring it in two places on the same day, the summer solstice, knowing that in one place, uh, the sun would be directly overhead, parallel to the pole, and in the other place, the pole would be uh, straight up at a slight angle to the sun. So he measured that angle, figured out the radius of the earth through like triangle math, and then the circumference of the earth from that. Um, I've been playing with that same kind of idea on and off, like figuring out where are we. I mean, basically anything big is like this room, but also the observable universe, uh, which is a lot of range in there when you think about it, obviously. Um, <clears throat> so creating a relationship to those that something that big and abstract is has been guiding me through these like next series of paintings that I'm gonna show you. Um, this is, uh, like it says, a future. Um, and I'm trying to picture Buckminster Fuller's spaceship Earth of, uh, oh, by the way, this is a painting. <laughs> it's about 20 inches tall by 16 inches wide. So it's not big, it's meant to be like modest. Um, and the little image there is just a little collaged image of Spaceship Earth at Epcot Center, uh, as it will be uh, when the uh, coastline <laughs> moves in there. And uh, so this is, yeah, like it says, future coastline when Earth no longer possesses sea ice. This is what we will lose. Um, not to mention many of the places that those first explorers of the Americas came through. Um, so at some point, someone's gonna see that vista, which kind of blows my mind. Um, or people will use it as like ecotourism, like this painting. 
the, the text in the painting says, uh, to go visit the sunken remains of Epcot Center. Around the time that I made that piece, my daughter was born, Amelia, and there's crazy man Jack at four years old now with his little sister. Um, I don't know, I guess, like, having children, it is true that they, you do start thinking more about the future. Maybe making that piece was some kind of reaction to that. Um, this is construction of Spaceship Earth. Um, it's definitely going to be there. And then, if, I don't know, I haven't been on the inside of Spaceship Earth in a very long time. But uh, I was really taken as a kid by the Michelangelo, like animatronically painting the Sistine Chapel forever and ever, which according to like books I've read is probably kind of how he felt doing it. Um, and then you have people in togas in various periods of time and some cool like uh, computer age stuff. Uh, it's like a really weird thing that that's in there and that building is probably gonna be there uh, after we're gone. I don't, I, you know, Walt Disney was probably enough of a megalomaniac for that to be the idea, but, you know, it sure is like a dopey representation of us. Um, around the same time I made, or no, not around the same time, this is going back to 2015 again. I made this series of drawings called Scale In Out that goes from my right and left hand, and on the left it goes out to the observable universe, and on the right it goes into the smallest thing. Um, that we currently have a theory about. Uh, the scale in all the drawings is 20 centimeters. Um, and we move out, so on the left we have a human, and on the right, uh, a hair follicle, red blood cell, earth, sun, chromosome. It's cool because like eventually they like 10 to the 13 on the one and the 10 to the whatever on the other correspond sometimes. Um, and so there you go you have the observable universe, and uh, a string. Which I don't know, I'm not up on my physics. I don't know if they're talking about that anymore. There's a lot of people who have been hanging their hats on that one though, so it's probably gonna be a while before they let it go. Um, this is another piece I made, uh, 2015, um, called Everything Abridged. Um, and just like it says, it's everything abridged. It's the history of the universe laid out on that same spiral that I had uh, Hank Schiffmacher tattoo on my arm. Um, <clears throat> it really like synopsizes um, everything from the beginning of the Big Bang, the, I mean the beginning of the, from the Big Bang through to the present. Uh, and I just kind of wanted to know like where all these geologic eras and whatnot that you read about when you're looking up things on Wikipedia where they actually fall, where they are, where different things happen in relation to each other. And the spiral was like the most compact way basically to depict that. Um, and this painting is about 95 uh, wide and 92 inches tall. And it comes apart in three pieces because I wanted to make a big circle. Um, so it's like got two kind of C shapes that go around a circle and they all bolt together on the back, but it's all made on like half inch plywood so it doesn't look super clunky luckily. Um, I made a smaller version of that shortly after um, called Everything a Bridge Condensed with the idea of like continuing to go down further and farther and make it like a tinier and tinier thing, distilling it down to like just the information that I want on there. Similar vein, the rise and fall of life on Earth. Oh, I lost that one, but that's okay because I kind of want to skip this one and go ahead to my last thought since it's already 8 o'clock. <laughs> Okay. Parting thoughts. Um, this is like research I'm doing for maybe something I'll make or just image collecting and thinking about stuff. 
this is a map of the Milky Way galaxy with uh, the range we've been using to look at, uh, look for uh, exoplanets. Um, and we found like 3,700 in 20 years, which is pretty amazing. And about 20 of those are in the uh, habitable zone where water is liquid around other stars. Um, our next closest star, Proxima Centauri, 4.22 light years away, has a planet orbiting its habitable zone. I don't know if it has water or not. I'm not like that really, I'm you know an enthusiast, not a scientist. Um, The best bet, though, is TRAPPIST-1, 39 light years away, and it has uh, these, four, these D, E, F, G. Those planets are confirmed to have liquid water. And you go, oh, 39 light years, no problem, just got to go the speed of light. We're there, right? Um, I looked into, like, how long it would take to get there. It's never going to happen, probably. Um, <laughs> we've not really looked at... I looked also at like, okay, so there's this little pathetic thing that we've done here of looking, I mean, a great accomplishment, obviously, but the universe has like between 200 billion and 2 trillion uh, galaxies, and we've looked at like a little tiny smidgen of ours. Um, the fastest thing made by humans to date was the Juno spacecraft, which reached 165,000 miles an hour, being slung shot around uh, Jupiter. At that rate, it would take 817,000 years to get to TRAPPIST-1. Stephen Hawking um, had the idea to use laser beams to like propel little tiny space probes, and theoretically, they would go 134 million miles an hour, um, which would get you there in about 200 years, which is better. Um, but, you know, that's like a little tiny space probe. Last thing we had with people in it, uh, going fast was the space shuttle at 17,500 miles an hour. Um, at that speed, you'd be at Trappist in 1.5 million years, which like definitely would not be where you set out to get to by the time you got there. Um, all that is to say, I don't think we're going to get anywhere else, unfortunately. <laughs> um, last parting thought, I was with my 95-year-old uh, grandmother, uh, speaking of space shuttles, um, two weeks ago, and she said, do you remember when we saw the Challenger explode? And I said, yeah, I do, but I want to hear that story from your perspective. And so 1986, we're in Florida, I'm with my grandma going to get a Christmas photo taken with my cousin. Um, I'm five years old, and uh, we're listening to the launch on the radio, because in Central Florida in those days, anytime the space shuttle would take off, you would uh, be listening to the launch on the radio, or go out and look at it from the lawn of the school or whatever. Um, and got out, and there before our eyes, the Challenger had exploded. Um, and the story I hadn't recalled in a long time, but she, at 95 years old, had remembered it just the way it had happened in my mind, which I thought was interesting. Um, so with that, I'll wrap it up. Thank you all. If anyone has one. Okay, yes, sir, with the hat. Is there a, what was your reasoning for your, um, in your maps, inverting uh, you know, the Mexican area in Texas, traditional to what we usually see? Um, at first it was uh, like, it, well, that comes from that Fra Moro map, which is, um, I'll get back if you want me to. It's not that far. There he is. Uh, which is the, you know, Europe and Africa, as you can see there, inverted. And it was just before they had decided that, like, north was going to be the top on the map. So just it's a really, like, simple visual way to kind of call 
that preconceived standardization into question, like why, why is it up, you know? Um, I also like the fact that it sort of makes you look at the landmass in a different way, like usually they're unrecognizable, which can also be a clue that like maybe some of this information is not entirely accurate, um, which is the case sometimes in the pieces that I've made intentionally. Uh, like things can be like ginned up at times, um, which I'm not afraid to do. Um, at any rate, that's kind of why. It's like a clue that like history is objective and subjective, or not objective, it's subjective. Um, and you never know like if you're being told the truth, kind of. Yes? Given um, your interest, as I understand them, based on this presentation, why did you choose to? Uh, why did you choose art? Why did I choose art? Mm -hmm. Why did you choose to do? Um, as opposed to. Well, it just seems like your interest, like um, to get to your interest, I guess. I mean, that why? Why was? Why is art the best way to? I don't know. I kept thinking. Are these tributes to information or knowledge? Are these explorations of, are these ways to just hang out with it? Like if mm -hmm. you're making it, you get to hang out with it? It's more like the, the way that I look at it is that like the things that I make are artifacts of a journey. Mm -hmm. And so like I'm going somewhere and uh, you know, it might not be super exciting or maybe it is, but I'm gonna bring this back and try to share with you what I, uh, what I learned. I also like, it really helps me to understand these stories better by like going over the information a lot of times and not only like reading books, then writing it out and then like trying to make the writing better. Um, it's a really fantastic way of like setting those things in stone in my mind. But mainly yes, the idea of like bringing back an artifact. Mm -hmm. So it's sort of a means of travel in a way? Um, yeah. Yeah, definitely. Like, uh, you know, using the studio as like this imaginary space capsule. Hence my like helm here, which is, feels pretty cool. It's kind of like the one I have at home, actually. <laughs> that faces a window. <laughs> yes, sir? Well, I was just wondering if you could say, when did mankind decide that north is north and south is south? Uh, depicting maps of the world. I, I have no idea. It must have been after this one. So after 1450, for sure. Um, and I don't know why. I've never looked into that. It's like a kind of a, it's like a, 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 you bring it up as an obvious question that I have, you know, that kind of flew past me, I guess. But it's a good one. He's <laughs> good. All right. Thank you all so good. much. Thanks, y'all.